actually, a, the entire dissertation is available on my website. So if there's a particular section you're interested in that you'd like to actually go see the numbers and the tables for, I know this sounds shocking, like anybody would want to, but there is actually, I was rereading it today. I haven't touched it in like three months. I was rereading it today and I was like, well, actually, it's pretty interesting stuff. So um, it's all about, you know, professional development for faculty and why we do what we do and things like that. So it's actually pretty interesting stuff. Anyway, so um, that's all available too. So um, I paid the extra hundred dollars to leave an open copy on the internet. So somebody should go read it. <laughs> that's bizarre, isn't it? You have to pay money to have it be open. Okay. So anyways, uh, it's called a search for a CAP gap in collegiate math. And um, CAP stands for Knowledge, Attitudes, and Practices. Um, so really what I'm looking for, uh, uh, well, I'll get into that in a second, but that, that's what CAP stands for, just, just to give you a preview here. Um, and the drawings by Matt Moore, who's my illustrator. Um, so we're going to start with this question, um, why aren't we more successful at introducing new practices into the classrooms? Um, we have, certainly have student-centered practices, we've known about them for some time, things like group work and inquiry-based learning and project-based learning and things like that. But our adoption rate of these practices is very, very low, not just in two-year colleges, but in four-year colleges. In two-year colleges, we actually do a better job than four-year colleges, but it's still pretty dismal. So, um, you know, there's, there's a couple questions here. Um, and, and I want to start with this relationship, this CAP relationship. And this is one of those where I said I warned you if you sat in the back. This is, there's not any way to get this on the screen anywhere else. But um, I'll just walk you through a couple of the, the parts of this diagram. Knowledge and attitude about teaching and learning for any particular practice. And then we, we implement that, that becomes instructional practice, but our instructional practice also feeds back on what we believe about that practice. So, for example, an instructor tries group learning once, and the student's like, we just want you to lecture. And they go, oh, good, they just want me to lecture. And back to that, they, it changes their attitude about it. So they might have a favorable attitude to start with, actually try it, and cycle back to an unfavorable attitude or something like that. So these two things are very closely related. Um, there are a whole lot of contextual and instructor characteristics in the middle here, and I'll read them to you. There are things like control of teaching, how much control do you have over your classroom, your that level of class, etc., the content that goes into it. Um, do you have what you consider to be an appropriate class size? Um, how are the, how are the, what are the students like? Can they read? Can they write? Do they come to class? Those are all categorized into a, 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 a category called enabling student characteristics. Um, there's department support for teaching, you know, which at four-year schools is quite different than at two-year schools. And so it's an important, uh, it's more important to, to have that, I think, at the four-year to study at the four-year schools where research is really emphasized over teaching. Um, there's appropriate academic workload. How many credits are you teaching? No. Uh, and then appropriate learning space. What's your classroom environment like? Is it easy to do group work in the environment you're in? That kind of thing. So those are all contextual characteristics that might mitigate what happens between what you think is good and what you actually do. Um, and then as far as the instructor characteristics, there's all sorts of different instructor characteristics, but some of the ones I looked at were um, gender, work status, like full-time, part-time. Uh, I actually broke it down a bit more nuanced than that. I looked at your part-time and you want to be part-time. You're part time and you want to be full time. Um, you're part time or you're full time in another subject area and you teach math too. Those kinds of things because I thought those might be important. Um, educational cohort is uh, the, the, the year, the time period you took your last classes at whatever level. Because we tend to be influenced by the people who taught us last. Um, and so for some people who you know, have been teaching for 30 years, their last experience in college was 30 years ago, but for some people who have been teaching for 30 years, their last experience in college was five years ago when they got their PhD or something like that. So um, that, that educational cohort is different than years of experience. They're not necessarily the same. Um, and so because, of course, what you experience as a student makes you more likely to use it as a teacher. Um, and then a diversity of teaching experience, which is something I haven't seen in many studies, but I, my own personal hypothesis is that the, the larger the variety of classes you teach, the more likely you might be to try new things, um, which actually bears out in this, too. Um, so anyways, there's also uh, on this side here, there's uh, some, some characteristics about attitude that we'll look at. Um, the one instrument that I used that I talked more about last year, but I'm going to just touch on it this year, is called the ATI. It's a um, attitudes about, uh, what is it called? I can't even remember the acronym now. Uh, what does the I stand for? 
attitude. It's about um, teacher-focused and student-centered teaching techniques. And so it actually gives you a scale on both types of attitudes. What is this instructor's attitude towards teacher-focused techniques, like lecture? What is this instructor's attitude towards student-centered techniques, like group learning, collaborative, um, uh, project placement, et cetera? Okay? So um, I used that as one of the primary measurements. But then I also looked at beliefs about specific instructional practices. I pulled out of several other inventories that are out there and well-researched um, to look at things like uh, the compatibility of a practice with students, the environment, how much time does it take outside of class, things like that. Trying to kind of uh, work out why it is that instructors who know, we postulate, know about these teaching practices don't actually get over to there to use them. Okay? So that's the basic idea, and there's a lot more than, uh, about this. Oh, I also measured um, the instructor's knowledge of, of the teaching practice, where they're getting that knowledge from, what kind of professional development do they have, do they read a lot, those kinds of things. Um, so anyways, that's the kind of framework that's here. So basically what we're looking at is this gap between attitude and practice. And, um, well, the first thing I need to show is that there is a gap. Because while we all might recognize that there's a gap, there's nothing in the literature that actually says there is, in fact, a gap. There's a lot of people who allude to, their, to this surprising result that instructors think favorably about this, but then don't use it. There's a lot of kind of qualitative, uh, flowery language at the end of papers that kind of says, huh, it's interesting, but nobody's actually quantified, you know, how, is there really one, or is it just an an anecdotal thing? Um, how, how big is it, that kind of thing. So uh, the first thing I had to do was prove that there was a gap, or see if there was a gap, and then try to see if I could tell what was there. Um, so the problem was that there was almost no information about community college instructors to begin with. Um, the only information we have to go on is the CVMS surveys, which are conducted jointly by um, AAMS and um, AMATIC uh, every five years. And those surveys ask department heads to report on what happens with all of their instructors. Yeah, so, so ask yourself, self, how much does my department head actually know about what happens in my classroom? And then, and then you know, you'll understand that that, that data is not actually so hot. Um, at least not when you're looking at things like attitude. It might measure plus or minus 10% general practices. You'll see in some places it, it Sometimes it does better than others. Uh, but uh, the, so in order to even tell what the gap was, I first had to measure a whole bunch of stuff that has never been measured. Which turned out to be that could have just been the dissertation right there. So cool. Uh, so the survey instrument, I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. It's a little bit complex. It starts out here, uh, you know, standard, do you want to participate? It asks a bunch of questions about um, work status and what kinds of professional development activities that instructor participates in, and then demographic information, experience, education, um, what kinds of courses you teach. Instructors are actually just given a long list of courses and check, they can check out anything they had ever taught. Because what I wanted, one of my variables was the variety of things that they taught, does that influence the way they teach. Uh, then they had to complete this approach as a teaching inventory, the ATI, which was 22 items. Then they had to choose a level um, because uh, we were trying to see actually if one of the things we hoped to have enough data on, it didn't turn out we did, I did, was um, at the level, is there a difference between, say, what, what instructors say at the algebra level versus the pre calculus level versus the calculus level? But you can imagine that community colleges, what are you going to get the most hits on here? <laughs> Developmental is algebra level. So uh, the algebra level was just so many more respondents than the other two that there wasn't enough data to really. No, that's the triple cross you're putting out of Australia. Oh. If you look it up, it's just the ATI, and you can find papers on it. Or if you just go look at my dissertation, you can get the reference for it. Um, so then they, so after they chose a level to like think about for the survey, because we do different things in a calculus class than what we might do in an algebra class. So, you know, it's, it's important to be focused on one level when you're answering questions about your beliefs. I might believe that calculus students are capable of different things than algebra students, for example. So they were asked to choose a level at which to take the survey. And then they, based on that level, were asked some questions about their teaching environment. Um, and then uh, they were given an explanation of the, 
particular math, uh, math instructional practices, or I'm going to call them NIPs from now on, that I was interested in. So while I really wanted to do six, at some point the survey was way too long, so we only looked at three. And those were lecture, kind of for a baseline, um, collaborative learning, and um, inquiry-based learning were the three. So two student-centered practices and the one very traditional practice that is almost universally used. So after, um, so they would see a, an ex, a, like a description of the practice with several examples of how it might be used, both with and without the technology, um, and then um, be asked, well, how how often? Um, well, have, well, of course they were asking, so have you heard of this before? Right? Because the other problem is there's so many different ways to describe like cooperative learning, cooperative learning, collaborative learning, group learning, group work. You know, there's a lot of ways to describe it. So we had to be very clear about what it was we are talking about. So they, they were given some examples and, and asked, you know, have you ever heard of this before? Um, and then they were asked to go through 20 items from each of those things that basically pinpointed what their beliefs actually were about them. Not their general beliefs, which is what the ATI matters, just general beliefs towards student-centered or instructor-centered practices. Um, but these looked specifically at, you know, like cooperative learning. Um, is this hard to use with students who can't read? Is this, and actually we're all phrases, is this is easy to. So this is easy to use even if my students don't read well. This is easy to use even if my students don't attend class all the time. This is easy to use, um, it, this does not involve a lot of extra prep time, things like that. So these 20 items on each, they were always the same 20 items, but with a different uh, practice to be looked at in, in here. Um, so you can see it's actually getting quite long if you're adding up all the questions. which is, um, how much do you actually use these things? And rather than kind of having it be an open-ended um, question, they were asked, uh, I used something that physics research uses, was kind of a scale of frequency. Like, I use this once as never, I use this once or twice a semester, all the way to, I use this a couple times a week. Right, so there's, and, and they could use, and it was very clear in the survey, you could use everything all the time if you wanted to. And you could say, I lecture and I use collaborative learning, but I don't use inquiry based learning. And the reason that was asked at the very end was we wanted to gain the confidence of the participants. That we had asked them about everything that could possibly be bugging them about these topics before we asked them the big question what do you actually use? Because um, there was a real fear that if we asked students what they used up, or asked instructors what they used up front, that they would just overestimate what they did. I never lecture and I always use group work, right? Which we all know can not possibly be true, but um, you know that, that we had to gain the confidence of the participants, and after they thought through all of this stuff, ask them to, to kind of break them against each other. You know, how often do I actually use these things? They didn't give it quite a bit of thought by that point. So at that point, most of them I did into the survey. They were given the option to go through three more, which I won't talk about here because I haven't actually looked at the data yet. Um, but the ones I really wanted to also talk about but couldn't for mastery learning and communication skills project-based learning, but too many things already, so that was not done, okay? So that was a survey instrument. Uh, I actually didn't do a sample, I looked at a whole population. We have in Michigan a database of all of the community college instructors in Michigan, both full-time and part-time. It's a database that Mishmatic maintains. Every year when we have a meeting, we ask people to update their list so it's accurate about once a year. Um, and so there were, um, uh, 903 people, instructors on the list, and uh, there were 192 that participated in the survey, which is a response rate of close to 20%, which is about the same as other surveys of this type um, that are done electronically. Um, we, because we knew that the response rates are not so high for these types of surveys, I mean, even the CBMS survey, I don't know if you just saw the data that was, maybe it was only in the delegate packet, I don't know. Even the CBMS survey, which is only sent to department heads, and they really like ran them to fill it out, was only like 43%, you know, at the community college level. So it's not too bad. And um, there was a participation incentive. There was a drawing for $300 gift certificates to try to encourage participation. There were follow-ups to everybody who hadn't um, participated. So, and then I looked at all of the different um, waves of responses to make sure there wasn't any significant differences between the groups, and there wasn't. So anyways, 21% respondents, but keep in mind that that's so 192 instructors total that, that participated. Um, so uh, one of the interesting results is that the first thing you have to do is just collect a lot of data. Um, so the first thing we'll look at here is the work status divide. Uh, with teaching experience and educational background, and there's a lot of research out there that shows 
shows in general uh, what the divide is in professional development stuff for all full-time and part-time faculty. This is, to my knowledge, the first one that looks specifically at math full-time and part-time faculty across the whole state instead of just like at one college. Um, so I'll just kind of point out some interesting things here um, about just about the respondents. Um, 100% of the respondents, of the full-time respondents, had taught algebra, which would be different at the four-year level, I'm sure. Um, and 88% of the part-time had taught algebra. Um, if you go up in level, though, you'll see that it drops off precipitously for part-timers at calculus here, full-time instructors. 90% of them had taught calculus at some point. 32% of part-timers had taught calculus at some point. So. You can, and that's, not, that's probably no big surprise to us, but it's nice to have a quantification for those types of things. Um, Post-calculus is actually kind of interesting. Post-calculus, only 46% of full-time instructors have taught post-calculus ever. And um, part-timers, it's about 17%. Um, and then when you look at the number of different math courses, and this is one I would pay attention to because this turns out to be important later. Um, how many different math courses has the participant been taught? I'm not talking about number of sections, but different courses. Like, calculus is a different course than pre-calculus, is a different course than math and liberal arts, which is a different course than calculus two, et cetera, okay? Um, and they weren't asked to report this number, but remember I asked them a list, I gave them a list of all the math courses taught at community colleges, and they could check off all the ones they ever taught, so I calculated it based on their list. So there's no, you know, I'm pretty sure instructors know what they have taught in their past. It's a pretty accurate number. Um, so full-time instructors, more than half of them have taught more than 10 different math courses. Part-time instructors, only 15% of them have taught more than 10 different math courses. Um, and even looking like down here at the part-timers, there are a lot of them who have taught three to five courses, um, but there are 16% of the population has only taught one or two different courses. And again, we shouldn't be surprised by any of this. You guys are community college instructors, you know how it works, okay? But that turns out to be significant later on because that variable did turn out to be significant later on. So then there's all this stuff on years of experience, um, which turns out to not be so significant. Um, the educational cohort, the highest degree they earned. Um, I, I also asked them what kind of degrees they had. So again, it was like a list. So you could say what bachelor's degrees you had, what master's and master's degrees you had, what PhD degrees you had, and I can sort the data any which way based on those lists. So if anybody ever has a need to know what percentage of people had a whatever degree, I can actually go back to the data and look at that. Um, none of this stuff was particularly interesting, although I will say that the ed degree, people always think, well, people with an education degree would be a lot more likely to use alternate instructional practices. That actually turns out to be false later on. They know about them, but are no more likely to use them. And full-time and part-time, um, part-time we actually had a slight, slight bit more instructors from part-time who had some kind of education-related degree, which would be education, math education, physics education, some kind of education-related degree. Um, also, the sample was slightly more female than male, but also the, the population at community colleges is a little skewed too. Okay, so um, how knowledgeable are community college faculty about instructional practices? And I want to try to go through this pretty quickly. Um, I looked at, um, just let me go back, how do they receive this knowledge? So I looked at all these different demographics. So basically every demographic you could ever want to know, all of the tables are in the dissertation. So if I don't cover something here you're curious about, you can go find the right table and see. Um, all the data is there. Um, but specifically um, for knowledge of inquiry-based learning, I mean, full-time instructors pretty much said no matter what the teaching method, they knew about it, okay? And this is just, um, there's three levels of knowledge. There's, um, there's like, I've heard, there's information knowledge, there's how-to knowledge, and there's principles knowledge. And all I'm really asking here is the information knowledge. Have you heard of it, right? It was already too long of a survey to ask about the rest. Um, Part-time instructors also said they knew pretty much about these. There is a little bit of a drop-off part-time instructors, but not as much as you might think. Um, they said they knew about these practices at a lesser rate, but and, and they were significant for inquiry-based learning and cooperative learning. Um, but uh, it is kind of surprising that a couple of instructors claimed they never heard about the lecture method, but okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> what's interesting is that uh, females were more significantly likely to know about cooperative learning and inquiry-based learning, and sorry guys, they were also more likely it's called the gender effect, and it's been shown in other types of educational research uh, as well. It's not the first time it's come up, but it did confirm the gender effect is there in math as well. So uh, it, it's it actually pretty interesting. Um, okay, so you'll see here also there's this little 
So like, was gender still significant when you only looked at full time and when you only looked at part time, right? And so you'll see here occasionally this little asterisk, also significant when you look in the part time group, okay? Uh, so here's what I found. Uh, instructors who had taught remedial math courses were more likely to know about collaborative learning than instructors who had not taught remedial math courses. And uh, just a little bit more. Instructors who had taught calculus were more likely to know about inquiry-based learning than those who had not taught calculus. And that might actually not be surprising because there's been this whole calculus reform movement with labs and, uh, and things like that. So with the whole idea of the inquiry-based learning, of the whole Hal Hughes textbook and all of that. But that's been around for 20 years. So, but it, I mean, this might be a research that actually bears out the fact that they made some impact. I mean, not as much as they would like, but there is something. One was that um, instructors knew about inquiry-based learning if they had completed their coursework in the last decade. Like 95% of them knew about inquiry-based learning if they had completed their coursework in the last decade, whereas if you look at the um, earliest, the, the oldest instructors, or at least education-wise, the ones who have been out of school the longest, we'll say, um, only 70% of them knew about that, what that was, right? Um, and that shouldn't be surprising, I don't think, but it does show that there is a um, also, instructors with education-related degrees were more likely to know about inquiry-based learning. Although I said, you already know this, not any more likely to use it. Okay, so um, how do people learn about, uh, or, or if they knew about the instructional practice, how do they first learn about it? Now, the first thing I'm going to say is many did not remember how they learned about it, and that was actually an option. In the pilot, we had many instructors say, I don't remember how I learned about this, so we gave them that as an option. Um, but of those who did know, I mean, the, the thing that should, again, not be surprising, but we needed a measurement for it, 90% learned with the lecture method. That was their first exposure to it. I was a student. What's interesting is if you look at cooperative learning, only 7% said they learned that way as a student. Right? And only 6% said they'd ever used inquiry-based learning as a student, which may tell us a lot about why instructors are so it's so hard for them to adopt these practices. They never experienced it on the other side. Um, and so there's some numbers in here about how else they might have learned about it, but because so many people didn't remember, I, I will assume they remember what they ever had as a student. But for the rest, it's hard to say. But the majority of learned in professional training or from a colleague or by reading about it. And you, again, all the new the nuanced numbers are in the, in the paper if you want, if you're curious about one in particular. So what kinds of professional development do we do at the community college? That's how we get our knowledge of things. If experienced it as a student. Um, and so uh, here's participation in uh, formal and informal professional development activities. Um, there's all sorts of stuff in here to look at. Uh, I'm just going to read you kind of the general categories I looked at. Just general professional development on campus. There's math specific professional development both on campus and off campus. Reading articles related to teaching math, both paper formats and web based formats. If you're interested, the data's there. Uh, social interactions related to teaching math in face-to-face -face environments and online environments, that data is all in there. Um, and then informal online activities, reading or social activities. So all that's in there, and I guess the important thing to, to, that I'll just say about this data is, of course, not surprisingly, full-time instructors do all of the work. Right? But there's a quantification of about how much more. And the numbers did line up pretty well with other national studies of general faculty. Um, at least for the full time where that stuff is available. Um, although I will say that those studies don't, you don't see quite as much of a gap between full time and part time as you see in here. Um, so, uh, moving on. So what's the influence of specific demographics on the types of training that, that um, community college instructors receive? And so the, basically I'm going to look at who is more likely to participate in general professional development so this, this is who comes out in the top, right? Um, Full-time instructors, uh, those who are in the latest educational cohort, not the most recent graduates, but the oldest graduates, the ones who've been out of school the longest. Of course, that doesn't say whether they participate as a facilitator or as a participant, right? Didn't think to ask that. Um, those who have a math or stats degree, as opposed to those who do not, that's a yes or no, either I have one or I don't. Um, so 
Um, those who have taught pre-calculus, calculus, or post-calculus, of course, those would be which instructors more likely? Full-time. Um, those who have taught a larger variety of math courses? Full-time. You can see why the full-time part time becomes so important in all of this, right? So then, who is more likely to participate in math specific PD? You probably don't see much difference at the top of that list, although I will say that the interesting thing is anyone who's taught remedial math or calculus is more likely to participate in math specific professional development. Because so the ones who teach remedial math are probably frustrated at trying to find anything that can help them. And the ones that teach calculus have been for all that calc reform, and there's a lot of professional development available for that, right? And they're probably more interested in going off to talk to instructors who teach calculus because they might be the only one in their college. Um, and also those who taught a large variety of math courses, again, most likely the full-time folks, right? These are the ones who participate in math and student PD. Okay, who gets to participate in off-campus math PD? Well, you know this story pretty well now. Um, it's pretty much those who you would expect. Um, it is the only time that years of experience came in. The only time in the whole study that years of experience was significant in any way was this one right here, most likely to participate in off-campus professional development. Yeah. Are you counting the webinars as off campus? Um, I didn't think to do that. Because I think yeah. you know, some of the most recent educational cohort might count webinars. Yeah, they might. Yeah, they might. Even though they're sitting in their chair. The research was about a year and a half ago now, so if I was to rewrite it now, I'd probably include a calendar for that. You're right. The research gets old quick. <laughs> right. Um, so, so that's what I'll say about that. Um, Frequent use, because remember I'm trying to see what happens between knowledge and practice. 
skill. Like, for example, for cooperative learning. Cooperative learning is effective uh, for student learning. Students will enjoy learning with cooperative learning. Cooperative learning makes good use of class time. Uh, it would be easy for me to use cooperative learning even if I had large classes. Uh, things like that. So, so they have basically 20 items like that to voice all the reasons why they might not like to use it, like legitimate reasons, and then an open comment field, just in case I didn't cover it in there, right? And they, this was piloted actually twice before we ran it, just to try to make sure we covered everything in this. Um, so, so they're given a lot of chance to, um, to talk about this, grading time, prep time, what is it like with repeat students, et cetera, and again, all that's in tables so you can look at exactly how people responded. Um, but one item really stuck out of here, both in the comment section and in the ratings. Instructors pretty much believed overall that none of those things would keep them from using one of these techniques, except for one thing. But you know, when you look at the, the data columns, it's like all four, you know, pretty low to mid fours of everything until you hit that. If there were less con content to cover in courses, I would be more inclined to use this. And that one just like went off the charts in the other direction. Um, and not only did it go off the charts in the other direction, but this is where people decided to use the comment field. Not only were they asked about it, but they typed a lot about it too. And so, you know, about cooperative learning, 21 of them made some comment to the effect that there wasn't enough time to use cooperative learning with all the content they had to cover. So, uh, and then 17 of them um, said there was too much content to cover. For, again, like, after 20 more questions, they still felt the need to write some more about this particular topic. And I have actually selections of those comments and other things they said in tables in here too, so you can go look at some of the things that other things instructors said were they felt they still needed to talk about at the end to answer all those questions. Um, so then we get to finally the relationship, this, this big question, is there a cap gap? Okay? So is there a cap gap? So I looked at attitudes, I looked for, I came up with a measurement for favorable attitudes. Instructors either did have a favorable attitude or they did not have a favorable attitude. It's like a zero or one category at that point. Okay, so um, I looked at, uh, at that, and so cooperative learning, they had to have knowledge of cooperative learning in the first place and a favorable attitude. So if I just sorted by that, what percentage actually used it? And it turned out to be about 75% who had knowledge and, and favorable attitude use cooperative learning. Which makes you wonder about the other 25%. That's not as bad as inquiry-based learning, where um, if they had a knowledge of it and a favorable attitude, only 38% used it. So that means that a little over 60% who, like, who, who say they like it, there's nothing in their way, are not using it. Right, so that's a cap gap. That's a gap between knowledge and attitude and practice. Um, so then the... Um, what was really interesting too is the non-favorable attitude. So if you looked at the other side, people who did not have a favorable attitude and still used the practice, right? So um, even people with a non-favorable attitude use some of these, but look, for lectures, particularly interesting, 72% of instructors with a non-favorable attitude still used it, right? So that, that does tell you that there's something going on here and that that content thing might be actually more important than we think it is. You know, we like, well, we might not, but other people like to conclude it, you know, like, you can use cooperative learning no matter what. You can use this no matter what. But content seems to be fairly on the mind of these instructors. This is a real problem and a real issue. Um, so if we just look at inquiry-based learning, since that's the one with the biggest gap, you know, can you predict whether an instructor, so this is because the more interesting thing, not even know that there's a cap gap. Yes, done. Check, there is a cap gap. Okay, now, now that you know that, can you predict what an instructor will do based on knowing some stuff about them? And, and if so, what variables turn out to be predictors? So, um, so what I'm looking for here is the difference between frequent use or non-room frequent use. So basically, it's in two categories. You're either a user regularly, or you're not. You're infrequent or non user Okay, so all of these are logistic regression models. I'm not going to show you the models, but I'll tell you what the result of them is. It's all in the dissertation if you want to see the models. Um, so here's what, um, what turned out to be, uh, to affect the models Models. That CCSF scale, a favorable attitude in general about student-centered teaching, um, whether they said they needed more training or not. So if they didn't say they needed more training to use this, um, that was more of a predictor of use than if they said, if they didn't say that. Um, having a say in how courses are run, but of course that would relate directly to content, wouldn't it? Having a 
one other variable uh, that full-time, part-time was fairly important because it relates to all those other stuff. The models, like I said, are in the paper if you want to look at that. But I want to get to the implications and conclusion. I think this is a, there's a big in, uh, thing here about faculty hiring. Um, you know, we've got to pay attention to all, all of this stuff when we think about, you know, what is our full-time, part-time ratio? Or even stuff like, are we going to let our part-time instructors teach a variety of classes, or are we going to have them just teach the same class over and over and over? We may actually be stunting um, what, what they do in their classes by having them teach the exact same class over and over and over. That the variety they get by teaching a couple of other classes may improve their teaching of, or their willingness to try new things in the one class they teach most often. So that we need to have better mentoring um, to get at that, that one variable that keeps coming up, which is the variety of courses taught. Um, I think it also has major implications for course redesign. The biggest one being, how much is in these courses? Maybe there really just is too much in these courses. And if we can't change how much is in the course, maybe we have to change how much credits that course is. Like if we want instructors to use collaborative learning, maybe we go from a four credit class to a five credit class and say, you must spend at least one hour a week doing some kind of collaborative or inquiry based learning in these classes with these students. But instructors are really pushing back against the idea that there is time to have both coverage of the content and the room to try other things. Um, and so there either needs to be some kind of professional development that proves to instructors they can do both or more time in those classes or less content. And so um, I think that's a fairly important thing. And I don't think, based on the number of instructors um, talking about this, I don't think that that's an unreal thing. I think, I think instructors really do feel there's too much content, there's been too much textbook drift. And then last, uh, it talks quite a bit to professional development that um, you know, our, there is a huge gap in what our part time instructors and part time instructors get from us. And that's not necessarily it's some of its free choice. Um, but there are also, if you go in and look at the data, there's quite a few full-time instructors who are doing very little. Very little. And that's, that's a little disturbing, and maybe we should be better at placing ourselves, too. So anyways, um, that's it. And like I said, you can find my um, the whole dissertation online. If you go to my website, and I have some bookmarks up here with my website address, and you go to About Publications, it's right there. Just click on the link. It's a PDF. So you don't have to print it, you can just go find the tables you're interested in. You can, I think, also you know, get a copy from UMI or whatever if you want to print it version of it. Because I can't.